Hello, and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOFT webinar. This webcast is part of ACM SIGSOFT's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOFT webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Robert Dyer, Assistant Professor at Bowling Green State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command-R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. Control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Assessing the State of Software Production Capabilities by Randy Hackbarth and David Weiss. David is an Emeritus Professor of Software Engineering at Iowa State University. David and Randy are both co-founders and partners of Sustainable Software, LLC. They both previously worked at Bell Labs and Avaya Labs, and both have spent many years as researchers and consultants in the field of software engineering with an emphasis on software production. Randy and David, without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Robert, and uh, welcome, everyone. We appreciate your coming and uh, listening today and hope you find it interesting and in fact we hope you will take some actions as a result. Um, this is one in a series of webinars that is sponsored by Sustainable Software. Uh, Sustainable Software is a small company that is interested in helping people uh, make their software more sustainable. In other words, make the software last over a long period of time with high quality, with high customer satisfaction, and to be easily changeable over that period of time. Um, let me give you a, a, a real quick little overview of what we're going to talk about. The basic idea here is to try to improve the state of software production and know it. Now, you notice I said software production. And if you look at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see I've defined production as creation, payment, and evolution. This is based on the idea that when you produce a software product, you wish and you hope, and if you're successful, it will last a long period of time. What that means is you're going to have to make changes to it. You're going to have customers who are asking for various kinds of things. You want to be sure it's of high quality. You want to be sure you can continue to maintain it and evolve it. And what we are suggesting is that we should be using an evidence-based approach to improve software production particularly if you are in an organization that does software production, you ought to have some evidence of how good a job you are doing. What we're going to suggest is that you apply the goal question metric method for this, and we will go into that in considerable more detail in a little while, that particularly you relate your evidence to your business goals so that your software then is going to be closely related to helping you achieve your business goals. And the third thing is, we would like you to be able to establish standardized data across your organization so you can compare. In fact, what we would really like to see happen is for this approach to be used across the software industry to try to improve software production across the industry as a whole. That means we'll need standardized data across the industry. Um, this, it turns out to be difficult collecting the data, analyzing the data, but it turns out to be very worthwhile. And I'll give you a few examples uh, in a minute. The other thing is it will help us as software engineers, computer scientists, developers, researchers, <coughs> excuse me, producers, to understand better what works for software production and what doesn't work, and to have ways of determining what works and what doesn't work, and to know it. This you will see, I've said, is routinely done in, in many industries. I'll give you a couple of examples in, in, in just a moment. Now, I know there are places in the software industry where we do this, uh, mostly in individual companies, uh, and mostly those companies do not like to publish their data. 
there's not a lot of evidence that they use standardized data uh, across the industry. Uh, they think uh, often that it is a competitive advantage for them to do this, and they're right about that, but they do not want to reveal any, any of their methods. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at other industries, uh, you will see that they do reveal their data. And we'll take a look at that in a second. So one of the questions I have in mind as, as I go through this is, do you do this in your organization? And I hope you'll be thinking about that. And I hope you'll be thinking about things like, well, how do I do this? Um, how can I make it better? Uh, is it somebody else who's doing this? Could somebody help me do this? All of those I hope you will keep in mind. <clears throat> uh, we are just going to have time to look at a few examples. So I listed a couple of references there. These references talk about <clears throat> the same process in much more detail. Uh, they're publicly available. Uh, the second one there uh, was published in the Art and Science of Analyzing Software Data. And notice it says, assessing the state of software in a large enterprise, a 12-year retrospective. Well, this was done a couple of years ago. So we now really have about 14 years or more of experience in doing this. A lot of this experience was in the companies that Robert mentioned, uh, Bell Labs, uh, Lucent Technologies, Avaya, and we're going to give you some examples uh, taken from that. So let's take a look for a moment at what they do with in some other industries. I happen to live in Iowa at the moment, and as you probably know, Iowans are very interested in corn. And this is a little chart uh, that shows corn yield, uh, corn yield in bushels per acre across the U.S. It goes back 20 years, more than 20 years, goes back to 1980, actually. Uh, it's published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And you can see those blue and those purple lines show you what was planted, um, how much was, was harvested, and there is that red curve there, and the red curve shows you what actually happened, and then it's a production, projection. So this was published in 2008, and that red curve there, that red line, is a projection of what they expect to happen. Now, as it turned out, a few years ago, soon after I moved to, to uh, Iowa, I had a chance to ride in the combine during harvest. Uh, and one of the things I noticed was there was this uh, display on the, on the combine that showed in real time the yield that the combine was getting during the harvest. So you could actually see the number of bushels per acre. So this measure had been so standardized that it was automated and it was built into things like combines. Uh, so the whole industry uh, used that. Here's a second example, different industry. So this is the automobile industry, right? This comes from, I think, 2008, and it shows you the top 10 vehicle assembly plants in the world. It also shows you how many hours per vehicle it took to assemble a vehicle and whether they improved over the past year or they got worse so, over the past year. Again, standardized data across the whole industry uh, to answer some interesting questions. Let me just take a second here and say to you, could you do this for software? Could we do this for software? Could you tell, could we as an industry tell uh, what were the most productive software production sites or organizations in the country or in the world? Can you do that within your company? I've worked in a number of different companies. Last company I worked in, which was, which was Avaya, had sites all over the world. Did we have a good way of comparing the productivity of one site with another? No, I don't think we did um, in, in any case. So this idea of assessing how well you're doing uh, based on evidence is quite common. You see it in a lot of different industries. What do you need to do it? You need consistent, standardized data. You need evidence of the state of the practice in the organization. You need evidence of your progress towards achieving your goals. You need evidence of the value of different methods and technologies. Um, if you've been in software, in the software industry for a while, you probably know that there are sort of uh, hinges of religious beliefs in, in different types of uh, development processes. Uh, and different processes become popular at different times and among different parts of the industry. Wouldn't it be nice if we had real evidence to show us how well these processes actually worked and to be able to compare them? Not only that, we'd like to be able to make predictions. Uh, about things like uh, how much software could we produce next year? Um, 
how much software would we sell next year? Uh, what's the quality of our software? How do, how do customers feel about that? And people have some answers to some of these questions, but the answers are often based on different data, and they answer the question a little bit differently. And then finally, that last one there that says, how effective are different approaches? So if I'm in the agriculture industry, how effective is crop rotation? If I'm doing manufacturing, how effective is it to bring in robots? Uh, if I'm doing navigation, how effective is it to use GPS? If I'm doing software development, how effective is it to use agile techniques or some other techniques? These are questions for which we really need to know the answer. Now, if you're in the software industry, and if you've been there for a while, as, as I have, you realize that software is taking over the world. Almost everything we do these days is, is uh, controlled by or guided by software, and it's gradually increasing. A few more years when we have self-driving cars, uh, software is going to control all the traffic in the roads. And a lot of these questions will become quite important. Um, we might be interested in knowing, for example, how many fatalities are caused by bugs in the software in self-driving cars. Uh, in some industries, they do that already. The avionics industry, you can actually find that out if you, if you dig deep enough. But in most of the rest of our industry, we don't. The other thing you see um, in different industries is that the kind of evidence we're talking about often leads to rapid major advances. In agriculture, for example, in uh, 1900, nearly half of the workforce uh, in the country, in the U.S., was engaged in agriculture, and about 40% of people's income went to food. By 1930, about 20% of the workforce was engaged in agriculture, and about 20% of the income went, went, went to food. Uh, this comes out of an article by Atul Gawande, by the way, in the New Yorker a few years ago. And it turns out that what happened was the Department of Agriculture placed agents across the country to help farmers determine what were the best methods and to introduce those best methods. If you're curious, by the way, today less than 2% of our population works in, in agri agriculture, and we spend maybe 8 to 10% of our, of our income um, on food. So there's a definite improvement. Um, of course, when you do this, sometimes you see effects that uh, you didn't exactly look for. So we're going to present to you a very systematic approach for doing this. But uh, even if you collect the data, sometimes you notice interesting effects in the data. This has nothing to do with software, this chart, but it's kind of interesting. It shows you uh, cigarette com consumption in men and lung cancer in men. And you can probably see the correlation there without having to invoke any regression techniques. And you notice that they started collecting data maybe around 1900 on cigarette consumption. I don't think at that time that they had any notion that it might cause lung cancer. But by the time 1940 or 1960 came around, uh, the trend looked, looked pretty clear there. All right, so what could we do in, in software? We have very few examples of large-scale data collection right now. We don't have much standardization of data. You see some standards, standardization here and there. Also, what makes it difficult and interesting is we have very widely varying industrial set settings, everything from avionics to telecommunications to medical technology, entertainment. And the evidence that we see for what works and what doesn't work is often anecdotal or based on very small-scale trials, sometimes the university trials. So we need to start collecting evidence. And we can do it organization uh, by organization. All right. So what would we like to know? I mentioned the goal question metric approach. What the goal question metric approach does is it says first you identify goals of your software development process. For example, your goal might be to produce more new features with fewer defects, with fewer resources, and with resources that are more distributed. Next step is you propose questions whose answers establish progress towards the goals. For example, one of your questions might be, well, what exactly is my ratio of new features to bug fixes by product, or maybe by site, if I'm interested in seeing how effective my sites are. Then I try to define measures that can be used to answer those questions. In that case, measures, I think, are, are fairly clear. You want to look at the ratio of new feature modification requests, where modification request is a request to make a change that has been implemented, uh, new feature modification requests to bug fix modification requests. And again, I want to do it by product and by site, and I may have to normalize that. By the way, I bring up changes here. We're going to talk about changes a lot uh, over, the, over the course of this uh, 
of this webinar, we think that changes are really key in understanding software sustainment. Why? Because changes are your life if you are a software developer or a software sustainer. That's what happens. You are continually making changes. Um, even when you're doing your first development, every day you make changes. So it's really important to be able to measure how effective we are uh, in making changes. Then once you understand what measures you want, you should be able to validate the measures, both internally and externally, that is within your organization and across organizations. And then you should be able to establish some infrastructure for the data collection and analysis, something like a dashboard, for example. And we'll show you an example of that later on. And what you would like to do is automate the data collection and analysis as much as possible. Remember the example in the combine where they had automated the yield, uh, measurement of the yield, so that you didn't have to spend a lot of your extra time and effort trying to uh, send in what your yield was to the Department of Agriculture. So we need to automate that so that there is as little overhead as possible in collecting the data. Then once you go through these five things, establish the goals, define the questions, define the measures, do the validation, establish the infrastructure, you iterate because things are going to change. Your goals are going to change over time. All right, so suppose we could do this. I've listed some interesting questions. I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but I'll just look at a few of them. Uh, how much software could a developer produce in a year? Could you answer that in your company right now? How many changes per year can a software system sustain before it becomes un unmaintainable? Have you ever been in a situation where you're making so many changes you kind of lose track of what's going on in the software? Um, you can't read the code anymore because there's so many changes? Uh, that goes along with what's the most crucial knowledge you need to sustain a software system over its expected lifetime. One of my favorite examples here is the Vanguard satellites. These have been out there for 30 years now. They're controlled by software. They're out at the edges of the solar system, and yet their software gets updated. So for 30 years, they've main, been maintaining the knowledge they need to be able to change that. Um, what human resources do you need? Um, how long does it take to make a change to a software system? Now, this may be a question you have an answer to. Uh, these days, we have very good repositories, and the repositories can tell you uh, often how long it takes to make a change and how much it costs. Um, I already talked about fatalities per year resulting from software defects. And then, of course, one of the things that really interests me as a computer science researcher and a software engineer is what technology changes have the greatest impact on software productivity. In other words, what can we do that will make the, the biggest difference? Um, there are a couple of other interesting questions on the next on the next slide, but in the interest of time, I think I'm going to uh, just skip over those. Uh, but if you did this, then what do your answers look like? So I talked about a dashboard earlier. What are some of the things you might see on, on a dashboard? So this slide um, shows you the developer churn for a sample project. This is one of maybe 50 projects that we looked at. Uh, the red uh, curve there shows you the number of lines of code in the project over time, uh, time going back to um, about 1990 or so. And uh, the, the, the dark black line there, the dark black curve down at the bottom, shows you the number of developers with less than one year experience on the project. The upper black line, which actually has little trees in it, I don't know if you can quite see that, shows you the, the fraction of developers, sorry, fraction of developers that have uh, less than three years' experience in the project. So you can see over time, project is gaining more and more experience. And then all of a sudden, around 2006, the experience drops. And we see people have less and less experience. And then around 2008 or so, experience starts to increase again. What happened? Well, it turns out the project was moved offshore to an inexperienced group at that time. Um, we didn't know that when we first collected the data, but when we saw this, this, this effect, we started looking around to try to find out why. So the example we're going to do is assessment at Avaya. And I'll just tell you, um, there was a separate organization called the Avaya Resource Center for Software Technology in Avaya Labs that was set up to do this. There were basically two and a half people involved in this organization. Um, they cooperated and participated with all of the Avaya software production organizations. Um, 
and the leader of this of this group is Randy Hackbarth. And I am going to turn things over now to Randy, who will talk more about how it was done and give you some examples. Randy? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I'm going to describe a, uh, uh, an example of the goal-oriented assessment that David discussed in, in the context of these annual assessments at Avaya. Uh, we, we conducted these over a 14-year period uh, each year. It was called the uh, State of Software and Avaya Assessment, and, um, and we led this uh, in partnership with product organizations from across the company. Um, our leadership actually in this area was important for, for a couple of reasons. First, we had some insight. Uh, we were all experienced in, uh, quite experienced in software development. And second, um, we had objectivity because we were not involved in any individual product. So, in fact, uh, what we found at, over time is that business leaders and R&D leaders and, in fact, uh, many R&D staff all look forward to seeing the results of this annual assessment. We use GQM as, uh, as David described, and um, the examples are, uh, I'm going to describe today are based on the references at the bottom of the slide. These are, in fact, the same references Dave mentioned earlier. And uh, if you want more information than what's provided in the webinar, just feel free to reach out to, to, to David or to myself. So what is Avai anyway? Um, Avaya was a spin-off from, a, from a Lucent Technologies. It spun off in 2000. Um, <clears throat> Lucent itself was a spin-off from AT&T in, uh, I think, in, yeah, 1996. Um, at the time of spin-off, Avaya Labs was created under the, <clears throat> under the leadership of Ravi Sethi uh, with staff, research staff from Bell Labs as well as staff from other industry, uh, other companies, and uh, uh, from leading education institutes. Uh, if we go back to um, AT&T days, this uh, company has a long history of providing communication systems that were focused on the enterprise market. And these communication systems were often uh, mission critical and, and uh, software intensive. In fact, <clears throat> there's a good chance that you've probably, uh, I'm sure you've all used an Avaya call center, uh, you've probably all used a, a, a private business exchange from, from that company, and uh, you've probably all been called by a proactive dialer made in Avaya, just to give a few examples of some software intensive uh, systems from that company. Um, the rest of this uh, example, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to first focus on the approach we used. Uh, second, on the data sources that we used, uh, this is a really important area. Dave talked about the importance of standardization. Um, uh, we didn't start with standardization, and we probably didn't end with standardization. Uh, but if, if you're going to do this, you, you need to get a handle on your data sources. And third, uh, I'll provide a few examples of, of the analyses and the company actions that were taken as a result of this work. Um, so as we said, this team, this assessment was led by a small team in Avaya Labs. Dave gave that title. Uh, in the company, it was a, we were affectionately known as the ARC, um, and it was formed in 2002 based on uh, recognizing at the time that uh, software was very important to the company and improving the practice of software production in the company became a mission of the ARC along with the, that know it piece that uh, David mentioned at the very beginning. And because of, the, because of knowing it, we had a measurement component to our work, and this was, in fact, part of the purpose of the annual assessment. In our day-to-day -day work, we worked with, uh, with individual software development teams, with support teams to help them address their software production and, and deployment challenges. And this involved typically introducing uh, new technology or, and or introducing some industry-proven practices. And then we often, as a result of working with, say, an individual team, we might lead an, an initiative for deployment of these approaches more broadly within the company and monitoring their results. Okay, that's enough on that organization. So uh, what is our assessment approach? It's, uh, uh, this, this cycle is, of assessment really has four key steps. The first one is to... Uh, uh, Get commitment, and what we did here is we uh, 
elicited goals from business leaders and we gained their commitment for the assessment. I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example, some examples of that in the next slide. The next step is to gather and analyze the data. Um, and in, uh, let me say just for now, because we'll cover this in more detail, that our analysis is both quantitative and qualitative. The third step is a feedback step. In, in the feedback, we uh, share the uh, assessment results with the business leaders. Uh, this was typically done with, uh, in one-to-one -one meetings or with, uh, in, in small groups. But in addition to that uh, uh, level of feedback, we also created a version of the assessment that were actually made available to the entire R&D community for their review, and, uh, and, and it was actually uh, something that everybody looked forward to, and, and uh, we got a lot of uh, feedback on that. And then the fourth step is to implement action steps. Now, the organization actually chose which action steps to implement, but we provided as part of the assessment suggestions, and, 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 if, and whatever they chose, we would support that, and we would monitor the results. And, and then the cycle would continue because we would include the monitoring of the results in the next assessment. Um, I described this process kind of in the context of an annual uh, assessment, but in fact, we conducted uh, 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 quite a few assessments of this type simply for an individual team or an individual organization, too. So here's some examples of that first step, that is establishing goals and commits. Each year the assessment had a focus, and it was based on um, a, a business goal that was important to the corporation at that point in time. So, so for example, in 2011, our CEO asked us to examine the company's quality processes. Uh, he was especially concerned and interested in our assessment of the testing processes throughout the life cycle. So he wanted to know, well, what's, you know, what, what are we doing that's effective? Where are there gaps? What can, be, what can be improved? And so, as a result, the, the state of testing was a focus of the 2011 assessment. Okay, let's go to the second topic now, data sources. This company has really a rich and a diverse set of data sources associated with its software production. And I would expect any of you on the, on the call, on the, in, the, in this webinar, who uh, are in software production, uh, you, you do also, and let's just go through some, some examples. First of all, there's code repositories. They, they include lines of code, commit information, and branching information, and, uh, and so on. There's defect tracking systems that, that uh, track defects by various states. There's a, uh, a defect tracking systems also include field escalations and service requests and other types of data. Uh, there's demographic information that includes information about the distribution of the R&D staff, the, their experience, the churn, uh, and so on. There's uh, development data available like documentation review information and metrics on code coverage and uh, static analysis information and, and a whole bunch of other types of uh, development data information. There's a document repositories that include information on, say, design documents and test plans. Um, uh, in Avaya, nearly every project has a wiki that has a, a whole bunch of information, but it often includes a summary of their processes, their practices, their status, and, and, and other things. There's uh, quality data like interoperability of systems, uh, in-process metrics, uh, customer quality information, customer satisfaction information. There's, uh, there's sales information, like uh, distribution of products by release, uh, the uh, information on the configurations of the products and solutions at any individual customer site. There's upgrade information. Uh, and then there's a whole area of information from the support organizations, like escalations from the field. And in Avaya, uh, there's a term called customer found defects that uh, are those field escalations that actually result in, in um, uh, requiring changes to the software. So this is quite a wealth of data, but it also had drawbacks for us. And uh, in, in this chart, I want to uh, just uh, give you a, some, some feel for what some of those were. First of all, it required quite a bit of preparation to access the data and to clean the data so that it was available for analysis. Um, second, 
which is related to the first, each, each of those repositories is typically a very large data set distributed in uh, various places. Uh, they often had different schemas and different keywords. So if we just take defect tracking systems as an example, I suspect most of you are familiar with a variety of defect tracking systems. Um, as a result of acquisitions of other companies over, you know, since 2000, uh, over the years, uh, Avaya has inherited a whole bunch of different defect tracking systems. In fact, I, I would guess that if you think of almost any code repository, repository or any defect tracking system that's been used in industry in the last 20 years, it's probably been deployed at some point in, in that company. So all of these challenges required uh, uh, and, and diversity of data required rationalization of the data. Uh, another type of challenge was the quality of the data. Uh, there were different levels of detail provided and, the, and there's a potential of human error on de data input. So we handled this primarily by validating our understanding of any data we were working with with those individuals or organizations that were actually responsible for providing it. And we were also pretty careful about estimating potential error. Now fortunately this situation has improved quite a bit in recently within the company. It's established a data warehouse for, for data of this nature and it's, in, and it's standardizing on a, a, a small number of code repositories and defect tracking systems. Now the other, other part of our analysis is qualitative. Um, in addition to the quantitative that I was just describing. Our qualitative analysis was based first on our actual work during the year with organizations and as a result learning from their experiences and their challenges. It was based second on a, on a really kind of robust set of individual interviews that we conducted with, with, within the R&D organization but also with individuals outside the R&D organization. So this combination gave us a very good understanding of the development and the deployment and support life cycles that existed in the company and, of course, the variations in those, those uh, processes. Okay, so that's the data source summary. Um, I, um, I do want to, again, emphasize that uh, it's really critical for any assessment program to have a handle on your data, and David gave a, 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 a good call out there for uh, uh, trying to standardize on that. So next I'm going to uh, provide some example analysis that we performed as part of each of the assess annual assessments. I'm going to focus the rest of the discussion on, on one or two of these analyses, namely the first and second. Um, we'll be happy to provide uh, some offline information on the third item, predictability analysis. This was uh, earlier work. Uh, around 2005, it was motivated by a uh, need to improve business confidence in the schedule and staff commitments. And the fourth item, quality analysis from the customer perspective, is more recent work. Um, and Robbie Sethi and John Palferman are going to describe this program in a webinar on May 17th, and I encourage you to uh, go to that. So we're going to focus next on uh, analysis around demographic and project characteristics. So this was really one of our most popular analysis. You might, you might not expect that, but it was. Now, of course, the company has a corporate directory, and, and most projects really had good demographic information on their own staff. But we were pre able to provide a, a unique and what turned out to be really valuable insight across projects and across geographic locations is insight that nobody else in the company was able to provide at that time. And, I, and hopefully the example charts I'm going to show will uh, convince you of that. Two of the business goals that these analyses were addressing were effective transition of work from one location to another, and the other one was improving effectiveness of distributed software production teams in the first place. So here's the first example. One question associated with these effective team transition work goals is, well, how many projects actually do distributed development? So this chart is, is actually a fairly simple analysis, but it has important implications. 
Um, it's a single year snapshot of the distribution of projects across sites from a few years ago. The um, uh, 52 projects in our sample uh, are illustrated in this histogram. We found that 14 projects had developers on one site. Now that's the uh, that's the leftmost uh, histogram, left, leftmost bar on that chart. Uh, one one site, 14 projects. If if you if you go over in the horizontal axis to the three sites, you see that there's uh, nine projects. Although that might be hard to see, but it's nine projects at three sites. And then if you move all the way to the right, uh, counting nine, ten, and greater than ten, and adding those up. Seven of the 52 projects had uh, developers at nine or more sites. So this analysis really provided a strong motivation to improve our practices in distributed software development and actually resulted in work programs for us and, 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 and uh, programs that were ultimately uh, deployed within the company. So that's the first chart example. The second one is um, uh, shows a snapshot of R&D experience levels by country. So, so note the flags. Um, hopefully, you can see, the, for example, the Israeli flag, the um, the uh, uh, India flag, of course, the U.S. flag, the Canadian flag, and if you look really closely, there's several other flags in there. Um, the the horizontal axis shows experience bands by year. So. So for example, zero to five years experience, six to 10 years experience, 11 to 15 years experience, and so on. Um, the chart shows the analysis for one year and for a previous year. So if we go over to the uh, zero to five year band, uh, the right histogram is for the current year and the one to the left of it is for the previous year. So what are some, some observations from this chart? Well, if you look at the kind of the right hand side of the chart, uh, notice the domination of the uh, Canadian and the American flags there. In other words, U.S. and Canadian R&D staff dominate in the more experienced bands at the time of this analysis. If you go over way to the left, note that R&D staff from India dominate in the zero to five experience bands. So what does that say? Well, we did some qualitative analysis around this and we identified a business need to uh, improve cross-site mentoring and to improve training programs, especially training programs at sites that had less experienced developers. Okay, now here's a third example. Um, another question associated with the business goals was, well, how does productivity change over time? And this is an example for one individual project. Uh, David showed you a slide earlier that really had a similar look and feel. Uh, his was on developer churn, and it was also focused on a, on a sample project. In this analysis of a single project, we identified what we called a core group of developers. And, and that core group of developers were those developers who made 80% of the changes to the code base at any given point of time. The horizontal axis is time in, in years, and in this chart it goes from 98, 1998 to 2006. Uh, the vertical axis on the left is the number of changes per core developer per year, and that, and that ranges from about 300 changes to about 4,000 changes. And the associated graph with the, that axis is that black graph that goes up and down and actually up and down and up and down and up and down many times. Um, the vertical axis on the right is the number of lines of source code in the project's code base. And this is increasing from about 600,000 at the beginning of the time period to about 3 million over the course of the time period. And the associated graph is the dotted red monotonically increasing graph. Okay. Notice also that the project moved offshore to, the to an inexperienced group in 2006. And, and by the way, this, this graph and, and the uh, graph that David showed are for the same project. So here's two important takeaways from this analysis. And you might, by the way, think of others. But one is that productivity as measured by the number of changes per core developer per year, that was the metric we used, decreased just prior to the transfer of work. 
So if you look at 2006 and then look just to the left of that, notice the decrease in productivity. Second observation is that the productivity continued to decrease after the transfer of work. So if you look at 2006 to the right of that, it's continuing to decrease, and then it starts to increase. Our follow-up qualitative analysis confirmed a couple of things. One is that there was morale issues prior to the transfer of work that resulted in uh, the uh, reduction in productivity. And second, there were inexperience issues after the transfer of work that uh, also resulted in continued uh, productivity decrease. So notice then there's a few patterns that motivated some mitigation programs and further work on our part from these, uh, these kinds of analysis associated with project and demographic characteristics. One is um, distributed, <clears throat> distributed teams and, 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 and the need to make those teams effective. Uh, the second is uh, the importance of knowledge transfer associated with the transfer work. And third is the need to plan for and mitigate productivity issues associated with inexperienced teams. And, and here's some of the results that came out of that analysis. That is, these are some, some steps that were taken as a result of these analyses. The first one is that we conducted several software symposia at key offshore sites that were responsible for, that had taken on responsibility for these pr for projects. Uh, but these sites often had limited experience. So the benefit of the symposia for these sites was the sharing of experience, both sharing experience within the site, because there may have been other experts within that site, but also by bringing in uh, uh, experienced staff from other sites, we were able to share experience across sites. So that was one, one result from this kind of analysis. Another one is that we established a seminar series for uh, uh, on key practices uh, for offshore, offshore site teams. Uh, the content of the, of, of the series, was of the, each seminar was based on the needs identified by the uh, team leaders at the offshore sites, and uh, root cause analysis was one of the examples of what we did. The third one I think is really interesting. One of the things we did is we created some tools to identify the most fragile parts of a code base. And we identified the most fragile parts of a code base by those parts of code base that caused field defects. Then we created some tools and some, proce some procedures to, to mitigate potential issues when making changes to these fragile portions of the code base. Now this is really important for teams that have inherited a code base and who are not experts on that code base. It gave them some insight into their code base and also some help in figuring out how to best make changes to those fragile portions. I think you'd find this work interesting and useful, and actually we are planning to have a webinar on this topic later in the year. Okay, second, second topic is um, the assessment of key practices. And I, I'm going to uh, just say a few things about this one uh, be, because of time. Uh, the, the business goals are those you would probably expect, speed, quality, cost. Um, they varied from year to year uh, depending on um, what was most important. And for example, 2011, where well, there was a focus on um, testing practices. Um, this is a framework for uh, a, 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 an analysis that we did. Uh, uh, the full analysis is on the next slide. Next slide, I'll, I'll give you a little bit on the framework, and then I'll um, and then I'll briefly show you the full analysis. The framework uh, has as a horizontal axis. It shows the use the usage of a key practice. In this case, it's automated build management, and in the vertical axis, it shows the effectiveness of that practice. And so, um, uh, and it's got four quadrants. So, for example, automated build management, which is the one we're showing here at, at the time, was viewed as highly effective and high, with high usage. Uh, the colors of the legend, green, blue, and red, uh, indicate whether, it, whether the practice improved or did not improve or worsened during the course of the year. Usage wasn't hard to do. It had to do with uh, how, how widely deployed. Effectiveness was more complicated. 
and what we what we needed to do there. And I won't go into the details, but we uh, we use both quantitative factors and qualitative factors to assess the effectiveness of any practice. So that's that's what a framework looks like. This is the full the full the full uh, analysis. Uh, it's a one-year, one-page snapshot from 2007, and um, and shows um, over 20 practice areas. Um, this is analysis again that we were uniquely able to provide. Um, it was comprehensive. It was data guided. It was cross-organization. Um, and I want to emphasize we we not only were able to identify practices that needed attention, you know, like those in the low low area, for example. But just as important, we could provide some insight into how to improve it. And, and, and one way, of course, is per, perhaps bringing in good practices in industry. But often, because of the fact that we were working across organizations, uh, improvement might come from, a, from adapting or adopting practices already deployed in the company elsewhere. So um, that, that turned out to be very helpful, and uh, a, a, a lot of times that's, in fact, what happened. Um, in the next slide, uh, I just want to point out that, that um, uh, while some practices improved, some did not improve, this is a multi-year view. So, for example, pre predictability in the lower, in that lower uh, right-hand quadrant, which means high usage, low, uh, low effectiveness, it, it worsened year to year. It was around 2005 that we had a mitigation program, and we uh, uh, were able to address that. So what are some example results from key practices? One is uh, we established some build management improvement practices. Uh, that was in the early years of this program. And um, it's been uh, an area of continuous improvement since then. In fact, the company has a quite good build management program now uh, based on the Atlassian tool set. A second one is the static, a static analysis program was established in 2012 and 2013. There was an existing R&D council that provided governance for that program. I, I already mentioned the third one, the mitigating the most fragile portions of each project's code base, and I uh, will have a webinar later in the year. And the fourth one, uh, customer perception of quality, improvement of that. Uh, John Paulman and Robbie Sethi will describe a quality program associated with that on May 17th, and uh, along with an important industry metric called the Net Promoter Score. That's the, uh, it for the uh, examples. Uh, David, I'm going to give it back to you. Thank, you. Thank you, Randy. Randy knows that it takes me about uh, three minutes to get through a slide, and we have about three minutes left, and I have three slides. <laughs> okay, what's the conclusion from this? <clears throat> if you want to significantly improve software production in your organization and know it, you need to have some kind of standardized data you need to have some kind of evidence. This is routinely done in many industries. If you start now, it will make your organization more competitive in the future. If you would like some help, SUSO can help uh, with, with this. Use an evidence-based approach. We've hit this point again and again. Can't tell you how important I think this is. Uh, what Randy was talking about resulted every year in a state of software in a VIA report. But it was a continuing process. It wasn't like we started over every year. It's just that every year we took a snapshot at the end of the year and said, here's how we're doing this year. We could really use that for the U.S. as well. The entire industry would benefit for, for it. And if you're sitting here seriously thinking about this, you ought to be thinking about, okay, what should my next steps be? That would take me a whole other webinar to, to talk about, but you can go back, look at the examples, look at the references, and, and you'll see. Um, I'd like to end with two things. One is a quote from Lord Kelvin, who talks about how you know when you're doing something. How, what, how do you know when you have knowledge? And he says, if you can't express things in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. What you need is some kind of evidence. And I'll leave you to read through all of that. The other thing is, we would very much appreciate it if you could give us some feedback here. So we put a little survey together, just four questions. Um, you could uh, email your answers down to the contact at the bottom there. And, and basically, we would like to know what you think about this. Um, and also, whether there are any other webinar topics that you'd like to see uh, the ACM present. 
If you want to see the uh, su sustainable software website, there's a link to that there also. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for uh, listening, and uh, I will turn it back to Robert, who I think is going to uh, prioritize the questions for us. Robert? Thank you, David. So our first question is uh, a question about CMMI. Uh, so they would like to know, you know, how does what you have described today relate to this already existing notion of a capability maturity model integration? So let me, let me say that CMMI was a good start. It brought a lot of attention to the software industry and to how well we were doing. But all it does is it gives you a single number. Think back to those charts that Randy showed you in slides 34 and, and, uh, and 35. See if I can bring one of them up. Um, it shows you a number of different factors. These are the key factors that are affecting software development in this particular organization. CMMI doesn't do any of that. And CMMI is accomplished by, primarily by interviewing people uh, in a company. And based on the answers, um, based on, on, on the answers, then uh, it tells you what your level is. Now, it is true that if you are collecting empirical data, they will often put you at a higher level, a level four or a level five. But if you have specific goals in your organization, if your goal, for example, is speed rather than quality, CMMI will rate you low. It will not do very well, because CMMI is based on the idea that you want to produce high-quality high software. Robert? All right, so the next question is about productivity. Uh, and so specifically, when you're looking at productivity, isn't this kind of an apple versus orange type of issue? There's a lot of variables involved when we discuss productivity. Uh, and so when you're trying to develop empirical data based on productivity, how do you essentially do that? How do you manage all of the variables? So this is, this is a very big problem. Um, and the problem really goes back to the fact that we are in lots of different domains and developing software. We use lots of different technologies and techniques. Uh, we eventually settled on change. So you might have noticed in some of the graphs that we, we quantify productivity as the number of changes per year or changes per month that developers uh, could make. Um, and you may say, well, but there are lots of different kinds of changes. How do you know all the changes are the same? They're not. But what we found was we were looking at systems where there were thousands of changes that were made. And we think that uh, that is the best way of trying to assess productivity because some of the differences will sort of uh, smooth out over time. Uh, some of the systems we looked at had, say, 25,000 changes made over a number of years. So we could go back and, and, and look at that. There is no one really good answer to this, but we need to do something. And changes, I think, are a really, a really good start. Okay, so we've gotten several questions that are, are somewhat related here. So people are kind of wondering, when you propose all of these changes, do you get pushback from developers? And how do you basically overcome the skepticism that you might receive from the developers when you propose those changes? So our approach is a little different. As, as Randy described it, we try to work with the developers. So we produce this report every year um, on the state of software. And what we would do is work with the developers. We would show them our results and see if they thought um, that we were wrong or that we were misinterpreting and try to come to a better understanding. Um, to do this, you really have to work with all levels in the organization, everyone from CEO uh, to people who are doing software development, software testing, to people who are, who are managing. Um, and when they see the data, particularly when they see data from their projects and when they can see what's happening in their project based on that data, they become convinced. And I can tell you as a researcher in software engineering, if you suggest things to people and your suggestions don't turn out very well. They'll stop listening to you very quickly. But if your suggestions show them how to improve and show them things that, that will improve their work, they will listen to you um, and, and work with you. Uh, da Robert. David, Robert, could I add to that too? Um, it's a really sure. good question. Um, so uh, I mentioned that there were two things that we were able to bring to this analysis. One was uh, the fact that we had the people involved had some expertise ourselves. And two is that um, 
uh, that we were um, a, a separate organization that wasn't in any individual projects. Um, this question actually brings out a couple of other things that might be important in terms of thinking about this. A third thing is that we were not in any way uh, the owners of any development process. So, so we were just bringing suggestions. We weren't the ones who were enforcing. And so um, we, uh, it, 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 it wasn't like we were making any mandate. And so we were, it, it really came across, I think, to the organizations as, hey, this is, this is a, an objective view. Uh, here's some suggestions. You decide what to do. So that, that's one thing that I think helped with the skepticism. The other thing I, that I think helped with the skepticism, and, and that may have taken a, a little bit of time, but um, over time we, we got to know a good number of the teams. And, um, and so they knew who we, who we were, and I think there was some trust that was developed there. So th those, those were uh, a couple of other factors in this particular case. All right, thank you. We do have a question wondering that when you were doing this work, did you see any connection between your work on software assessment and security of the systems that were being developed? So, so uh, let me say that uh, security was not a prime concern at that time, when, first of all, when, when we started this. Uh, we were more concerned with improving the software production process. Now, you could say, okay, our goal is uh, – really to make our systems more secure. That did not turn out to be one of the business goals um, in the company that we were looking at, so it did not get a lot of attention. But if it did get attention, we would have tried to find ways to assess uh, uh, the security and the approaches that were being used to improve security. And there are people, there are people who, do, who do that. Okay. The next question is regarding uh, the fact that the assessments you showed were all essentially one year long assessments uh, and then the process was repeated every year. Um, so will that same process work in companies that are running a more agile methodology? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I assume that the uh, questioner is saying, well, since agile tends to move very fast, um, you have say three week sprints or something like that. Um, are you going to catch that in, in your data? And as long, uh, remember what we did was, uh, in a lot of ways, we looked at changes. As long as you're capturing the changes that you're making um, in agile developments, then yes. And in fact, you can uh, put up data in, in real time. So the productivity data that I showed, for example, you could do that in real time. You do that every week if you want, every month if you, if you want. So. Uh, it really depends on how quickly you can connect, can collect the data, and how quickly you can analyze it. And uh, in in the company in in Avaya, there was a set of dashboards that were company wide. You could look at any organization, you could look at any project, and they were kept up to date. They were uh, updated almost on a daily basis. So it depends on how much effort and time you're willing to put into the assessment, and how much you can automate the assessment. Uh, uh, an add-on to, to what David said is, is that uh, there's a quite a few projects in Avaya, especially in, the, say, the last five years, um, that used, uh, used sprints, um, uh, Scrum in particular, as part of their development phase. Um, and, um, and so part of our assessment, and yes, it was an annual assessment, but we did do some assessment of, of how effective those were in terms of uh, things like the quality of products, the quality of what was delivered from the sprint, and and um, uh, how well organizations were interoperating with the, those development teams, such as service organizations. With with with, uh, with if you're using a, um, a technique like a, a, a sprints, and you're turning you're handing it off, and you've got other organizations like like um, a support organization. Uh, uh, a test organization, marketing organizations, you know, all of those have to figure out some way of interfacing appropriately with those development teams. So, so we did do, we actually had a focus of, uh, uh, of a couple of our assessments on, on that. But if the question, questioner is asking, 
you know, maybe we should have done a monthly assessment. No, we, 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 we act, I mean, a good idea, but we, wouldn't, we didn't have the resources to do that. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. Thanks again to Randy and David for their informative presentation and their insightful answers to the many questions. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at www.sigsoft.org slash resources slash webinars.html. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at www.sigsoft.org. Note that the slides include a short survey on this webinar with a chance to suggest topics that you would like to hear in future webinars. On behalf of SIGSOFT, the speakers, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. And this, today, this concludes today's webinar.